I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 8th of November, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. Today's topic, the gringo gods of Nicaragua. All right, I know you're dying to know what this title is going to be about, and I'm gonna leave you wondering for just a minute more, but we are gonna be talking about what it's like from a mental perspective for Americans and potentially Canadians who are moving to places like Nicaragua and how that somewhat cool effect that you probably enjoy when you're a tourist may have some negative impacts on you when you look to do something more. This comes as we had a number of questions and comments on the show recently that made me sit and wonder what was causing some of the effects that we were seeing, and I think we've come to the root of some of it. So we're gonna be talking about that and more right after the bump. Welcome back everyone. It is a fantabulous day here in Nicaragua today. I'm here in Western Leon in the barrio of Sutiava. I am feeling good. I'm very energized, mostly because I have all of my ducks in a row and my paperwork is ready and all I have to do yet is pack. And I will be off to Bolivia where I'm gonna be spending the next two weeks. So I've mentioned it on the show a lot, but if you have not been following along, this is a good time to subscribe and to scroll down and ask any questions you may have about the show and just take a moment, hit that like button too, cause I really appreciate it. Uh, but it's a good time to get subscribed so that you can be ready to follow along with the adventures as we head off to Bolivia, which I'll be heading to on, uh, technically I'll be leaving on the 11th, but I'm not gonna be arriving until the 13th. It's a long way, it's a long flight path and bus route to get from here in Western Nicaragua all the way to central Bolivia, where I'm gonna be hanging out for a while and eventually ending up in La Paz, high up in the Andes. So I'm very excited about that trip. It is my first time ever actually going to South America. I know a lot of people think that we here in Nicaragua are in South America and you're close, but we're not. This is Central America and I used to live in Panama and I lived in Western Panama, which is very Central American-esque uh, and a lot of people consider Panama to be culturally a South American country and it majority is, uh, but it is technically in North America or in Central America as far as a continental shelf goes or that area. It's actually part of a different shelf, but uh, it is not part of the South American structure. Uh, so I have never actually crossed the Darien Gap and officially been in South America. So I'm very much looking forward to just getting my feet on the ground in Lima, Peru and being able to say I've got another continent under my belt, but going to Bolivia, hanging out with a number of friends there, which is going to be super cool and visiting three different cities, doing lots of food and hopefully Hopefully not getting altitude sickness, knock on wood, uh, and bringing you guys along on the GoPro is going to be really exciting. So, as I said, stay tuned for that, get subscribed. Make sure you turn on that even that little alarm bell that helps you know that a show has dropped. But I know you guys have questions and comments and all those kinds of things. Seriously, while I'm talking, just scroll down, say hi to people, leave some comments, ask your questions, it means a lot. But let's get right into today's topic. I had a number of comments recently, and legitimately I have these all the time, about people who have come to Nicaragua and end up having a really bad experience. I know some of you just come down and find it way too hot and you're sweating all the time and that's a bad experience. I get it, that's not what I'm talking about though. What I'm talking about is all the people who come primarily from North America, hence the title of today's particular episode, and they come and they, they try to start a business, they try to move here, and they end up having a really bad experience. A lot of things go wrong. And I sat and I thought about what all of the stories that I've heard over the years, because I've been in and out of Nicaragua for eight years and I've lived abroad uh, in general during that whole time as well. And one thing seems to be really consistent and it's something that I don't think people think about very often or at all. And it's gonna take people a little bit by surprise. And what that is, and I'm gonna call it the gringo God effect, when you come down, especially from the United States and Canada, but this certainly applies to people coming from other regions as well, you have two things that happen. One is that you're coming from generally very rich countries and often very large ones as well. And coming to Nicaragua, which is a very low income country and a very small country, there's a certain tendency towards feeling as though you have many resources or experiences or special somethings that people in Nicaragua don't have. This is not to imply in any way that this is a racist kind 
of response. And it's not something I really want to talk about, but it's important to point out that that's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that people who live in the United States, we're used to a giant country with giant numbers of resources. And when we come to Nicaragua or other places like this, we will often bring a lot of financial resources with us, a lot of world experiences that where we're moving to or, or visiting do not have, or what they have are very different. And this creates a certain amount of, oh, I'm able to do things very easily that the people who live in those places may struggle to do or may not be able to do. For example, you can go out to eat all the time or you can stay in nice hotels, you travel around and get to treat the country as a be beautiful, wonderful tourist destination. And the people who live in that country generally struggle to do so. They have to go to work and do normal things. They don't get to treat their country in that way. The other thing that happens is because you're a tourist, not because you're from America or from Canada or anything like that, simply because you're a tourist and you're here with tourist dollars, you are treated very differently by the people who live here because all of them are working for you, more or less. I'm not talking about random people on the street. They will mostly treat you either with indifference or with interest, which are basically the options. But they will often be like, ooh, an American, I haven't talked to an American before. If you're in Leon or Granada, they're not gonna do that. But if you're in a far-flung area, uh, you may easily be the only gringo someone has seen in a year or two. And it's of interest. Why are you here? What are you doing? Right. And so on one side, there's that kind of interest. But if you're in a restaurant or a hotel or taking a tour or anything else, you're going to get a lot of attention paid to you because you're where the money is coming from. You are the customer. If you combine these effects, I think what we tend to get is this gringo God mentality. It feels like when we come here that we wield amazing amounts of power, not because we're one group of people or another, simply because we're coming from one of a number of countries that have loads of resources. And when we come to other countries, it feels like we can do anything. And in many cases, we can. And this is exacerbated by countries in North America, like the United States, tend to be very authoritative. And they have a lot of laws that curtail normal things in normal life. This can create an effect of feeling like you can get away with anything, not because you're breaking the law or skirting some rule, but because you're so used to living in a place where everything's illegal and you have to be very, very careful about what you say and how you behave in public and if you carry a drink out of a bar and if you just just so many things that you're not allowed to do that we just accept as illegal when you grow up in the United States and when you come to a country like Nicaragua where there's a lot more freedoms it can often feel very naturally as if you're skirting the law and getting away with something when in reality you're simply visiting a country with a lot more uh, freedom and latitude in what you're allowed to do in everyday life that effect is stronger than it's easy to describe. It's amazing how many people even live here for quite some time and will say things like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I can actually just take a beer to go, or I can have a beer in the back of a car while someone else is driving. Of course you can't drink and drive here, but you can drink and ride here, which is, I don't know any place in the United States that allows that. So those little things that may seem very tiny on their own, when you put them all together, it really does create a strong feeling that doesn't apply to everyone, but to a very large group of the tourists who come here, especially from North America and Western Europe, will get this feeling of being able to get away with anything, financial resources that make all your problems get solved. You, you wanna get uh, land at the airport, you have no idea how you're gonna get to where you're going, just hire a taxi. How how expensive can it be? Oh, you're hungry and you don't want to cook for yourself? Just order in with Pedidos Ja. Just go to a restaurant. How expensive can it be? These little things add up and pretty soon you're like, money can solve problems. Nothing ever goes wrong because I can just throw money at it. You're only here for so long. You're a tourist all that time. It, it makes a very solid mentality of believing you have a level of power almost you don't really have. It's kind of like if you were to go to Cancun, Mexico, for example, and spend all of your time in an all-inclusive resort. If that is the only experience you have with Mexico, you may have a artificially created sense that when you're in Mexico, everybody is there to take care of you and nothing you do ever requires, you know, anything of, you don't have to do anything. Like everything is just taken care of. You don't like that your room is dirty, someone will clean it. You don't like that you're hungry, someone will feed you. You don't like that you're sober, someone will get you drunk. Absolutely. And if you do that enough and you forget to really think about what Mexico is like outside of an all-inclusive resort, it's easy to get a really weird 
kind of mental picture of where you fit into the ecosystem. And I think that a lot of Americans and Canadians and so forth are having that effect happen in Nicaragua because they tend to view it through such a strong touristic lens combined with this really strong coming from a giant country with a really large economy and a lot of individual wealth and coming to a country that is a very small country with a very small economy and limited individual wealth, uh, when you put that together, it's going to create a little bit of a God complex that if you're not careful, is going to lead to some things. And we're gonna talk about that. So what brings this up? What makes me actually start going down this path of analyzing why this would happen? The thing that happens is not that people behave badly. It's not like, oh, I'm so much better than other people. So I'm gonna, not like that at all. That's not what I mean to imply and no one should get that idea. What I'm saying is that I see a lot of people complain about things that they have happen, for example, if you live in the United States, we're just going to use the U.S. as an example, apply this to other places as necessary. You live in the United States and you've never opened your own business before. You would never occur to you because you know it's scary, it's difficult, and there's just a lot that goes into it. For those who have ever run a business in the United States, you know that successful businesses almost universally are going to have one or more lawyers that work for them, one or more accountants that work for them, bookkeepers, IT professionals, uh, people who maintain lots of different systems and lots of expensive software, and you probably are going to have some expensive office space or you know property that you're using for some portion of the business, depending on what you do. It's going to be really expensive and you're going to have a lot of highly trained professionals who are part of your team. You're not going to have those expertises under normal circumstances. You may have a expertise in, for example, manufacturing uh, thermoses for coffee. You know how to make amazing thermoses. You come up with some cool designs and some processes that make a factory really efficient. But you're not going to be the person who constructs the factory. You're not going to be the person who oversees the incorporation paperwork of the company. You're not going to be the person who checks the account payable to make sure that things are coming in and taxes are going out appropriately. You're not going to do that stuff. You're going to hire people who are good at those things, maybe full-time, maybe part-time, and you're going to do the things that you're good at. That's how normal business works in the United States and anywhere that you're being successful. When coming to Nicaragua, those same people who would not start that business in the United States, and, and let's just be clear, there is probably no market in the world where you have a better chance of success at starting a business than in the U.S., where you're actually taking success to mean that the company becomes viable and profitable over a relatively short period of time, not days, but possibly just a few years. There are very few, if any, markets that compete with the U.S. for just how easy it is to do that. The U.S. has the most resources, the most tech, you know, people that are able to do those things. The government is very uh, uh, accommodating to those processes. Taxes are low. Individual state and local governments uh, are set up to make this as easy as possible. Everything in, in all of society, not just in the business world, is lubricated in such a way to make that kind of investment and growth possible. And this is one of the big strengths and benefits of the United States compared to much of the world, the rest of the world, for sure. When coming to Nicaragua, you don't have all those resources and benefits that you start with in the United States. So you're already at a little bit of a disadvantage, not a general disadvantage. Nicaragua is far from the worst country in the world to try to start a business in. It is very accommodating to a lot of business. It offers a lot of uh, social and governmental lubrication to try to encourage people to do business here, to make it reasonably possible to do so. However, it does not make it as easy as the United States. Nowhere does. And it certainly doesn't mean that you could ever do the same things without the same resources that you would have in the United States. Meaning, you, if you're in the United States, you would definitely have to have a lawyer that you trust. You would definitely have to have an accountant that you trust. You definitely need a bookkeeper. You definitely need specialists in all these different areas. You need someone you trust to construct a building and so on and so forth. But for some reason, when people, especially from North America, move to Nicaragua, they often feel that they can go and start a business and skip all of the due diligence that they would do in the United States. And this applies to a lot more than just business, but that's the first thing we're looking at. So they'll come and they'll be like, I'm just gonna start a business. I don't need to sit down with specialists and talk about a business plan. I don't need to look at financial advisors and see if they think I'm doing something that makes sense. I don't need to have a trusted long-term lawyer that's going to help me uh, incorporate and make sure that that paperwork's right. I don't have to have a trusted long-term CPA that I trust to oversee my numbers and make sure I'm doing my tax structuring correctly and so on and so forth. Each of those pieces 
are things that are very dangerous in the United States where it's really easy compared to other places. To do the same things in Nicaragua is at least a little bit harder and you need those people even more, even if you're Nicaraguan. But if you're not Nicaraguan, if you're an American, you don't even have the resources, the knowledge, the cultural experience that Nicaraguans have, obviously. But we forget that and often we think, well, we come from the United States where things are so easy, we know how to do business, so therefore it gives us an advantage over Nicaraguans. That must be why they're failing at business because they're not Americans. But coming from America, we're able to do these things because we have some magic touch. And the answer is that's not true at all. You are actually coming into an environment where chances are everybody has more resources than you, everyone has more knowledge than you, everyone has more experience than you, and most of them are failing or not bothering to try to start a business because they can't. Because whatever it is you're trying to do, they've already determined doesn't make sense, and, and you're trying to do it without their ease of access. But why would you feel that you could do that? And I believe that is the gringo God complex. That is making you feel like something about you because when you're a tourist, when you're visiting, you have all these resources that you can bring to bear and that's gonna solve a lot of problems. And even if that's not solving problems, people are going to take care of you because you're a tourist. That's what we do with tourists, right? Not we as Nicaraguans, we as human humanity, right? When dealing with people who are visiting another place, we're like, ah, come stay at my house. Ah, let me make you food. Ah, let me give you directions. Ah, let me show you around. Because you're a tourist, you need help because you don't know. Right, so you, you get this mentality of the world's gonna help you, but the nature of business is no one's going to help you in business. Business is always caveat emptor. It is always your risk, your decisions, your, if it wasn't, who's gonna take those risks? The business owners take risks. That's what makes them business owners. And so if you're thinking you're going to skip the risk that you don't have to have the investment backing, you don't have to have the due diligence, you don't have to have the, the parts in place that you would need in America, you think somehow you can skip those things here, absolutely you're setting yourself up for failure. And routinely, when people say, oh, I started a business here and it failed, these are the things that they're doing. They're not doing what they would have needed to do in another market had they asked any business advisor, including one who had no knowledge of Nicaragua whatsoever, and simply said, I'm going to a new country, doesn't matter which one it is, here's the things I have done in my, my home country, none of which is running this kind of business, and I'm going to start, and I'm not gonna bring in specialists, I'm not gonna give myself years to learn the market, I'm not gonna, what are my chances of success? Any business advisor is always gonna go, I don't need to know anything more than that. There's zero chance of success. There's no way that you've come up with an idea while not doing any of the things that would give you the ability to identify a good idea without doing anything to give yourself the ability to manage the framework and the context and all those things that you need to be successful at business even in your home country that are really hard to do even in your home country. You're gonna do them in another country where you don't even know quite how to navigate the city or you don't know how to navigate personal relationships and how to find people and like just all these things you don't know how to do. How the heck could you possibly have a business that's going to be successful? You can't, that makes no sense whatsoever. So routinely we see these businesses failing based on this. Now there's reasons that other businesses fail too. The average business that does a good job is still going to fail. So. Don't look at everybody and say, well, that business has been here for a while and now it's failed. That must be the gringo God complex. It's not necessarily true, but if you're coming in and you've only been here for six months and you decided to start a business, everyone knows you're going to fail and we can predict why. And this is exactly why. What is the thing? In, in When I work in IT, we refer to this as being weird. It should absolutely just hit you that you're acting in a way that's really bizarre. You would never show up in the United States with no experience and simply say, you know what? I know nothing about this market. I don't have any idea what people need. I don't know how to hire people. I don't know what the legalities are. I don't know how to form a corporation. I've never looked into any of this. I'm just going to show up in a random place and decide to run a business that I know nothing probably about in a place where I have no expertise. And you see this all the time in people opening restaurants, but they don't know how to cook or they've never run a restaurant before. Opening a hotel, but they don't know how to be a maid or work at the front desk. They don't know how bookings work. They don't know how to interface with the vendors that are necessary. You see it with people opening tourism businesses where they're just a tourist and don't have any special knowledge of the location more than casual people passing through. People who are doing manufacturing, but don't know anything about what's missing or available on the market. Don't know what raw materials are available. People wanting to open coffee plantations, but they don't have any knowledge of how to get coffee or what export controls are needed or what need needed for import into the country they want to sell to and on and on. It's a constant thing where we see people coming in with zero expertise in a market where expertise already does exist to at least some degree in all of those areas. 
So why are those people already not successful? Because it takes more than that. It takes a lot to be successful in business. And starting from a, I don't even have the baseline of what a business should have to start with, it makes it all but impossible to ever make that business successful. Sure, you may be able to throw money at that business indefinitely and prop it up by working another job, perhaps one in North America, and just throw money at that business for forever and get to say, I own a business, it's yeah, it's cool, it's been open for 10 years, it's great. And then you find out that it's being propped up by savings or you're working another job to pay for it, or maybe it's breaking even but it's not paying for your time and you would have made more money by simply teaching English on the side instead. Those things are all signs of a failed business, just one that may not have closed yet. And that's absolutely fine. If you like running a business and it's a hobby and you enjoy owning a business just for the sake of owning it, or you want to have that business in place so that you have better connections with your local community, or you're trying to get residency through investment, or you just really like the services that it provides. Maybe you want all of your clothes to be custom made and you want to wear a different t-shirt every day. So you open a t-shirt factory that can make you 365 t-shirts a year and then sell some to other people if they're interested. Great. All those things are wonderful if you're realistic about what you're doing but it's really really dangerous to let the gringo god complex come in and and make us think that we're infallible that we can do reckless crazy things and that either the universe or the people around us are just going to bail us out all the time that's pretty much what we're expecting. I realize that the average person doing this is just oblivious. They don't realize why they're getting such a good experience as a tourist, and they think that being a perpetual tourist will somehow be a magical answer. And in some ways it is, don't get me wrong. I recommend moving to paradise as soon as you can. And maybe Nicaragua is not your paradise, find your paradise and get there. And maybe your paradise is your own home where you live today. That's possible. But for the average person, it is probably not. There's probably somewhere, especially if you're watching this show, somewhere in the world that's calling your name and Nicaragua might be it. And the fact that you could live under palm trees, have your dogs who are right here beside me eating a coconut that just fell off the tree together. The two of them are just sitting there eating a coconut. That's what you hear in the background and have these beautiful sunny days and spend so little to be able to live here with a high degree of safety and just find your paradise and get out there and search for your paradise and make paradise happen for you, absolutely. But don't become confused and think that just because you're able to visit and move to and live in paradise, that you don't have to do the things that you would reasonably have to do anywhere. It is not a panacea, it is not magic, it is not going to eliminate the need for you to have a source of income or savings. It is not going to eliminate the need for you to pay your taxes and to get residency. You still have to do the things of being an immigrant or you still have to do the things of being a tourist. You still have to follow the rules and do normal adult things. And that's unfortunate. It would be great if we all could just snap our fingers and not have to do anything ever, but we do. That's not gonna go away. It's not that you have to do more by living in paradise. You just don't get every single possible thing handed to you on a silver platter. Nowhere can do that. So you can't expect that it's gonna happen here either. We talk about this problem in relationship to businesses, but it happens in lots of other things as well. Examples are people who are moving down and buying houses immediately, right? We talk about this a lot on the show. Don't rush into buying a house because that's crazy. You don't know where you wanna live. You don't know what the market should be. All the same things with business. You don't have your ducks in a row. You don't have your legal team. You don't have your accounting team. You don't have a real estate evaluation team. You don't have a property evaluation. You know, the person who goes in and says, okay, you're, you're, you got leaks in the roof and you need to, like all those things. You need to have access to those things. Maybe you have a friend who has all of it. Maybe you have the, you assemble that team yourself, whatever, same as in America or Canada, wherever, don't be different. You would never rush into those things. The thing I think that makes you feel like you can bypass common sense, bypass due diligence is this gringo god thing that's going on. It just feels like nothing can go wrong because nothing ever does when you're a tourist. Everything is taken care of for you. And what little tiny things seem to go wrong are so easy to fix when you're just throwing money at it. Another example is coming down and immediately before you have residency without setting up a business without asking and getting advice, going out and buying a vehicle and putting it into a local's name. I wanna use this example specifically because this gets a little bit nutty and it shows how 
often people will come down and one, feel compelled to buy a vehicle. I don't know why people feel so strongly that they have to have a vehicle upon arrival. I know some people decide they want to live on a farm or really far out, or they just love being able to drive around and owning a car is part of their identity, especially if you're coming from the US or Canada. We're so used to our car being actually part of our identity that it's very difficult to let it go in some circumstances. I think that's a really unhealthy thing to bring with you, but some people just really love cars and giving it up is not a matter of their identity, but it's a matter of just something that they enjoy and they don't want to live in a place where they can't enjoy that. I understand. So in those cases, even then, it's important to have some patience. It takes time to, again, get your ducks in a row. If you want a car as soon as possible and just nothing else is such a high priority, work on your residency. Once you have your residency, you can buy a car like anyone else and that's taken care of for you. Or go and open a business, which you can do before you come down here. It doesn't have to be a profitable business. It doesn't have to be a successful business. It doesn't have to be much of anything. It just has to be a legal business that's able to legally purchase a car. And then you're able to have a car that is yours, free and clear, under a business that you own that is yours, free and clear. Not hard at all. The big limits that we talk about, the big expenses and efforts to, to setting up a company, those don't really exist when you're setting up a shell company whose job is to basically allow you to own a car, for example. That gets pretty cheap and easy. It's not nothing, but it's relatively easy and not something you have to worry about. What a lot of people end up doing though, and this I think again shows this what could go wrong, nothing bad will happen to me. But imagine if I was telling this story, as I tell it, imagine doing this in the United States as an immigrant who knows no one and has no resources. You move to a new country where you're as with all countries, right, I know no exception to this, you cannot buy a vehicle as a non-resident. You either need to get residency, citizenship, or have some kind of corporation, or some way to own and register a vehicle. Some people argue, but you can own a vehicle, and yes, you can't register it or insure it, whatever. The full process of having a vehicle isn't available to you under normal circumstances in most places until one of those, uh, the, those factors have been met. Imagine going to a new country and saying, okay, I don't want to wait. I'm impatient. I'm not going to wait until I have the paperwork in place to do this. I didn't set up a business ahead of time, or I don't want to use my business for this. I don't want to do those things. So I, I'm just saying I'm going to buy a vehicle even though I don't have a legal path to doing so. And what people tend to do is go find someone they've met. Now, remember, you're new to a country. So in very rare circumstances, do you have long-term deep friendships when you're new to a country? Even if you've been here for a year, chances are the people that you know, even the people you know well, you only know so well, right? You you have limited time with them and you go to someone you've met within a you know short period of time because if you've been here for very long, you'll have a business or you'll have a residency and, and you'll be able to get a car, no problem. So we're talking about people who've not been here for very long and you go out and you find someone and you say, look, I'd really like to put a car in your name and then I'll drive it. And you can think of a lot of things that go wrong here. First of all, there's liability. They're taking on risk for you, right? So you're actually asking something pretty large because they have a tax liability. If that car is involved in an accident, they're going to be uh, tied up and potentially jailed. Uh, if that car is stolen, they're gonna have to go deal with it. They're taking on not a tremendous amount of risk, but real risk for you. So it doesn't make sense for them to do this unless they're really altruistic friends. From your perspective, you you are putting up an incredible amount of money. A car, even in the United States, is it a very expensive purchase. But doing it in Nicaragua is an insane purchase. The average person doesn't own a car here. So that you're showing up and being like, I have to have a car when the average Nicaraguan by far, not like just 51%, but by like 85% of Nicaraguans never get to own a car in their lifetime. Many of them don't even get scooters or, or motorcycles. They're, they're on bicycle or on foot. Lots of people do have scooters, but you're, you're really getting into a level of affluence and in some ways kind of showing off that you can buy a car and honestly, imagine, ah, I can buy an expensive car that I don't, I'm not even gonna worry about being illegal and I'm just gonna put it in your name. That level of trust is kind of nuts, right? And I know people who've done this. I know people have done it with scooters. I know people have done it with cars and sometimes it works out, but the rate of it working out is not that high. And the number of Nicaraguans who want to be involved with that happening isn't that high either because it's not good for them either. There's no winners when this is done well. 
But imagine doing that. If you did that in the United States, you would absolutely expect that someone is going to steal your car. And it's not really stealing your car. You bought them a car. They're just not going to let you have it at some point. They may let you have it initially, and at some point they're going to take off with the car. You don't have the right to report it as stolen because it's not. It's their car. You don't have the right to say anything because it's their car. You might have a contract with them that says that you get to use that car under certain circumstances, but good luck enforcing that. That's going to be really difficult. It may be doable, but it's going to be difficult. And for them to not be able to sell that car and move on with the cash is going to be all but impossible. I'm not saying that there's zero circumstances where this should ever happen, but you really have to internalize what an extreme thing this is. It would never work in the United States. It's also not legal. Doing it here is basically the same. It's not illegal, but you are buying a car for another person and hoping they let you drive it in a situation where you just needed a little bit of patience. So to them, you're demonstrating absolute absence of patience and common sense while also showing off a great degree of hubris that you would put something so large into the name and ownership, the complete and utter ownership of a person you can't possibly have known for very long. Then, unlike the United States where that car is a big purchase, here in Nicaragua you could be looking at a car that represents a lifetime of income. Let's run some really quick numbers. A small car, something like a Toyota Corolla, right, could be about $25,000. I'm using those numbers intentionally. If you're getting something bigger, say a truck, like maybe a nice one, you may be looking at more like $50,000. And as Americans, these numbers seem actually a little bit low, right? We're probably talking used vehicles here. We're not talking about new ones or high-end ones or special trims or anything like that. We're just being reasonable. In one case, a reasonable car that a normal person would, would drive. And yes, you could get one for $12,000. You may find a really cheap one. I know people have done this with with really cheap scooters and if you know, the risk of someone taking off of the scooter is completely different and I understand but when you get into cars right let's work with these numbers at $25,000 for a small car that easily represents a decade of income for someone a decade not 10 months not one year 10 years of their life if they're 30 years old they may not see the amount of income that the value of that car has until they're 40 if you're talking about a truck, that could be a 20 or 30 year income equivalent for a lot of people. And that's assumed that's assuming that someone is working and getting fully paid at, yes, a roundabout minimum wage, but it is the national average because a lot of people are out of work as well for income. So imagine going to someone and saying, okay, so this is your entire adult working lifetime, not including like when you're a teenager, but from about age 25 to 55. And most Nicaraguans are going to be retiring around that age. They don't tend to work into their 60s because there aren't enough jobs to go around. So they try to let people retire early, start a little bit later, spend a little bit more time in university and shorten the working years so that they're able to spread out the jobs between more people who are at more prime high energy ages. It makes a lot of sense when you're in this kind of economic situation. So let's use the example of the truck at $75,000. This is a very expensive truck, but if you're getting a good high-end land cruiser work truck, it is reasonable that even a used one could cost this much. And while that may seem like an absurd amount of money to spend on a truck in the third world, keep in mind that here, if, if you're working in a field or doing certain things, you may be in a situation where you're dealing with a lot of rough roads. You may need uh, to keep a vehicle for 30 plus years. And these investments in really high-end land cruisers actually can pay off over over time. So people do save up and put money into these for business trucks for a reason. Their ability to last and be repaired is incredible and uh, their status symbols as well. But you can imagine why you might want to get one even if you're purely making a financial decision. So let's use this example because it's an extreme one but important. You have a $75,000 truck. You put that truck into the name of a Nicaraguan who is going to hold it for you and take on the risk of you having an accident or whatever. They haven't known you that long. We'll assume a year, but maybe a month, right? This is a person that may be a friend, but you're putting into their hands literally 30 years of their potential income if they're never out of work. And the average Nicaraguan is going to be out of work at some point during their adult lifetime, even if it's not that much. Putting that much money into their hands all at once. It doesn't matter if they're 25 or 55 or even if they're retired. It is a lifetime of potential earnings all in their name and legally theirs. The temptation 
to take off with that, given that you have demonstrated recklessness and a disregard for that money, a impatience and a, and a complete lack of need to protect those resources. It feels very logical that you don't particularly care about the money, not that they want to steal from you, not that they don't want you to do well, not that they want any harm to come to you, but you show a callousness towards the value of that vehicle, a value that you cannot comprehend what that means to a family that may have been on the verge of starvation. That money represents enough to go out and in cash pay for three houses for the family. That is enough money to buy a house and start a new business. Not a tiny work from home business, but an actual honest to goodness, full fledged business. You could become an Airbnb aficionado with many properties with that. If you were renting instead of buying, it gives you the, the banking power to go get 20 properties and take a risk on a huge Airbnb empire. It gives you enough money to potentially open a really tiny hotel. I know properties that have sold for $100,000, for example. If you come in with 75,000, chances are bank is gonna help you with that last 25,000 and you could open a 30 room beach hotel in central Nicaragua. Wouldn't be a great one, but it would be a basic one. But at 30 rooms and you're willing to put in some, some elbow grease, you could have a really large investment property that your whole family can work at and can live at and make potentially many times the income they would ever have while owning it instead of working for someone else. The opportunities that you hand to someone to take care of their family, the old members of their family, the children who are coming up to leave a legacy for them, Imagine someone handing you the equivalent in the United States. A foreigner that you barely know comes to the country. Maybe they're coming from Saudi Arabia and you perceive them as being wealthy on oil money because that's very much a rough equivalent to how Nicaraguans would see Americans coming to Nicaragua. There's some magical fountain of cash coming up in the United States that means we have endless access to more money. Maybe we're not super ultra rich individually, but we can always go back and work in the United States. There's always more money to be found. They're not wrong, right? Much like in Saudi Arabia, if someone is coming in, maybe they don't have access to that oil money, but you perceive that they do. It feels like someone's just, you know, digging a stick into the ground and cash is just flying into the air. It's not actually what's happening, but it really feels that way to someone who's coming from that other environment. We feel that way about Saudis. That's not what's happening, but we feel that way. And Nicaraguans feel that way about us. So it's very hard to picture this person who's been handed so many resources, that has so much future access to resources, who's willing to take such an unbelievable risk of handing us a lifetime of income and just trusting that they won't use it and looking at their own family and saying, I could take care of my parents. I could set my children up for life. I could guarantee that the things we're afraid of will never happen to us. I'll never be out of work and unable to put food on the table. I'll never have to worry about my extended family. I will be able to protect them for all time, for many generations, all off of $75,000 that you put into their hands. When you say it in that way, if you said to an American, here's a Lamborghini, it's worth five million dollars, which is kind of the equivalent in money here. And you said, okay, I'm gonna put it in your name. It's completely yours in every way whatsoever. And if I have an accident with it, I promise that I won't hold you liable, but you know, the court might, I can't stop them. Will you hold on to it for me for the indefinite future? Sure, you might be willing to do that. But if you were starving in America, if you had family to take care of, at some point, if you knew that all you had to do was keep that car or sell that car and that you would have a guaranteed lifetime of care for your entire family, you're gonna be tempted to do it. A lot of Americans don't live in that level of poverty where taking $5 million would make the difference between starvation or panic and comfort. Normally it's, well, we're not starving and we have a house, but boy, that would be a lot of cool money to have. That makes it a lot easier to resist taking that vehicle because you're not saving a life. You're not keeping destitution at bay. But if you were, I bet the challenge to not take advantage of the money that's put into your hands that's sitting in your bank account is going to be very, very difficult one to overcome. So that's an important thing to picture here. And I'm not saying that the average person would take advantage of that. The average person won't, but it's such a large temptation. It is such a just showing off how much more we probably have than people who are here in on average 
that it's going to create a situation where enough people are going to take advantage of that situation, that everyone's going to know someone who has a horror story of it happening, because so many people do this. That's what's amazing. So many people, as we think through how crazy that sounds, yet everybody knows someone who's done it. I've talked to multiple people in the last month who have done that. And in all cases, it ended badly, but there's definitely cases where it has not ended badly. And in uh, only one case was it that there was a problem because someone took off of the vehicle. One was that the person who did it was also crazy in other ways, because that is often the case when you do those things. But it's an important thing to understand that in all these situations, I believe we have this commonality. The commonality being that we are acting like by being gringos and coming to Nicaragua or any of a number of places, and it doesn't have to be Latin America, that is the only region that refers to us as gringos. But if you were going to Central Africa, for example, uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa, to any number of the DRC, or to Chad, or to uh, the Central African Republic, or potentially to even a Tanzania or Uganda, you may have an income level so great, and people will treat you as such a novelty. And it doesn't even mean that they have to treat you as super special, like you're you know, better or have access to resources. But many people will because they believe you're somehow important because you're different. Or you do have access to resources. Because let's be honest, simply by being a foreigner in any country, unless there's just too many of you, uh, specifically whatever type of foreigner you are. So Canadians in Nicaragua are not very special because there's just so many of them. But if you're a, uh, let's just say, a, uh, uh, you're, you're Polish and living in Nicaragua, you're a unique specimen. There may be some uh, top back to Poland that you have that reasonably no one else in the country has and you may be off able to offer a conduit maybe for selling some Nicaraguan product like furniture to Poland or maybe you can be a conduit for some product like Polish vodka being imported into Nicaragua and that's your special talent right and that makes you a special person and people don't know exactly what your specialty is going to be but they know when you're a foreigner that you offer an opportunity that their neighbor doesn't and so you always get treated with some degree of special speciality because of that factor by people, no matter where you are. But you're also often, by being an expat, by coming from another country, by having the resources to make those decisions, you're often adventurous and affluent and in one way or another able to do things that the average person cannot. And so you are almost always treated specially because you are special in at least some way. As that effect grows, the risks that you are going to begin to believe it yourself take a hold and the risk is that you actually do start to think that society and culture or the universe is going to protect you from yourself and that you can basically do no wrong and it's not that you're trying to do harm it's not that you're trying to do something bad that's not at all what I'm trying to say I'm saying that you'll start making decisions you'll start taking actions that really don't make much sense and you will you will put yourself in a position where there is no one to save you, where logically no one's going to uh, be at a point where it's like, oh, we have to protect him from himself because he's the rich, lovable idiot. That's not what's gonna happen. They're gonna say, whoa, we don't have the resources to bail you out. We don't have the knowledge and experience to save you from yourself. We thought you knew what you were doing. You're the one who came from an environment with more resources. You're the one who had more access to education on this. You had the ability to go watch Scott's channel and see what other people have done wrong. You have access to all these things that we probably don't have access to one, why would we bail you out? It doesn't make any sense. And two, how could we bail you out? We probably can't. And that's where you start to overlook that, oh, up until now, it was I was asking someone for directions because they knew how to get somewhere. I needed someone to help me go to the market and go shopping. Things that didn't really take any resources and they were just being nice and they wanted to help you because they do want to help you. But when you put them in that position of there's no way for them to help you, there's no way for them to help you. And the universe is not going to intercede on your behalf just because you came from a rich country and went to a much lower income country and thought that everything would be handed to you on a silver platter for forever, even when it came to being a business person and investing. So watch out for the gringo God complex. And I feel really good about this episode. I feel like this is one that people need to hear because it's not very often that we actually dig in and say, what is the underlying thing that's causing people to go crazy? We talk about all these crazy things that people do. 
And I'm always at a loss. What is making people act this way? And I think this really might be a huge part of it. And our own culture in North America definitely encourages this. They push very hard that Americans are special. We're taught this in our own country, right? We all know about the third graders who get a big reward or a ward for moving up to the fourth grade. Oh my gosh, you're such an accomplished third grader. You've moved to the fourth grade. That happens to almost nobody. No, it happens to everybody. And you showed up, you only had six sick days this year. You get an award for that because it's so hard to not be sick more than six days in a year. And like there's, we, we support, we, we celebrate mediocrity and normality all the time to the point where we all talk about how there's entire generations who believe that they can do no wrong, that everything is worth a reward, that everything is an accomplishment. And when you treat everyone that way and then add to it the very strong, yay, yay, America, we have all these things, we're smarter, more successful, whatever, than everyone else in the world, and you start making people feel that way, and then they go and experience a new country, and at first, it's reinforced because one, we demand that that's how we be treated. That's what makes us keep coming back as tourists. So they treat us that way as tourists, as long as they're milking our dollars. And sometimes, yes, you do make legitimate friends and there's great people everywhere while you're a tourist and in that mode. But over time, you have to convert to being someone who actually lives there. And you start have to start facing the realities of, yeah, you may have some cool advantages. Yeah, you may have some cool background and that may be with you for forever, but the universe is not going to intercede on your behalf and keep you from hurting yourself when you decide to do something that goes above and beyond what people can help you with. You need to do your due diligence. You need to engage your brain. I say this a lot and use common sense and you have to not treat Nicaragua or anywhere else that you move to as being magic. It may be a better environment, it may be paradise, it may be the right place for you, it may be a great place to start a business, but you need to think of it in the same way that you would in the United States, plus any additional risks of not having the experience, not having the resources, not having the knowledge of the local market. Combine it. Be patient, be normal, and remember, nobody knows less about doing business in the new country than you. If other people aren't doing it, if the locals aren't doing it, why would you be successful at it? You need to have a really strong answer to that. And we'll talk about that in other episodes, how you know, how you identify when an opportunity is a good one here or in business in general. But here you have to make it that much more extreme. You need to be absolutely sure that you know what you're doing and you've put in lots of time, lots of patience, lots of research, lots of first hand witnessing of how things work over a long period of time before you start making those kinds of decisions. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support this channel and all the work that we do, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me. And thank you so much for everyone who supports the channel. As always, post on social media, tell your friends and family about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow.